Uh, well, Rick asked me to speak uh, tonight about some tools for having difficult conversations. It's a lot of pain in our world right now, uh, very heartrending times for many, um, and a certain kind of existential fear, I think, and dread that uh, many are experiencing. Um, I think in the forefront of many of our minds is uh, the unfolding war in Israel and Gaza and really frighteningly devastating death toll uh, in Gaza, along with the, uh, the horror of the attacks in Israel that preceded it. Um, it's a humanitarian crisis unfolding in real time, but I'm sure as many of you know, it's not the only place in the world where there's really, really difficult things happening. Uh, war in many places, uh, hunger, refugee crisis, not to mention the sort of larger <laughs> ecological crisis or the political situation here and abroad that's uh, very disconcerting. So it's a lot of difficult things um, to talk about with a lot of intensity. So I want to speak a little bit about how we can have conversations that matter and that are meaningful with so much intensity and pain in our lives and in our world. And I think the first thing I want to acknowledge is that when it comes to such difficult and intense topics, um, the energy and the emotion tends to run very high, particularly around political things. Um, these are tied to deep needs for belonging, for safety, um, for identity and worldview. These are aspects of ourself and our experience that don't shift easily. And challenging uh, somebody on their views or their beliefs in this way many times can feel like an attack on one's sense of self which then stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and the fight, flight, freeze response. So people can respond quite vehemently or forcefully, and it makes it difficult to engage in a meaningful way. Uh, in particular, with the war in the Middle East, um, as we know, there are generations of trauma that are feeding into this personally, historically. Um, so the intensity of the feelings and the reactivity is very high. When trauma is present, the tendency biologically is to center our own experience, our own pain, our own fear. And there's a certain lack of choice about how we engage relationally when we're hypervigilant, which makes it very difficult to entertain other points of view or express ourselves in constructive ways. So um, this is the context and I think it's very important to bear this in mind as we consider having conversations. At the same time, I think we can recognize the importance of dialogue. Um, the tension, the differences are already there. Not naming it, not having the conversation isn't going to help. One important aspect uh, of social change is sharing our views with those close to us, with our family, with our friends, with our community, uh, particularly with people who, with whom we don't see eye to eye. And whether we look back at the civil rights movement, um, at the women's movement, the anti-war movement, the gay, gay rights movement, what seemed like intractable uh, positions can shift in a culture over time in part through individual connections and conversations. And so the intense emotion and the violence around the Middle East is another example of this and one that we're living through right now. So one aspect of this is perhaps sharing our own views in a way that other, others can hear, but perhaps more importantly, also helping people feel heard and understood so that there's more openness to actually engaging with other points of view. I read an article in the New York Times, uh, might have been today, I think, or yesterday, um, about two people in the United States who had different views on the war in the Middle East and trying to hear each other. And the article ended on a very um, somewhat depressing and disappointing note, this sense of like, 
not being able to hear each other and did it make any difference and does it matter? And I think it is really possible to have different kinds of conversations. We can train ourselves to find balance when we're triggered, to stay connected to our deeper intentions in a difficult conversation, to hear the goodness behind other people's words, even when we disagree with them, and also to set limits with love and with care in a way that doesn't damage a relationship or alienate others. So I want to talk tonight about four different areas of training ourselves for having difficult conversations and then go through some key tools for each. So I'm just going to bring up a slide here. So uh, I'll say each of the four and then I'll talk some about, about each of them. Preparing inwardly for the conversation, reflecting on our purpose and our values, rehearsing for the conversation, and then building certain key tools for actually having the conversation. So let's talk about preparing for a conversation, particularly if we're entering a conversation with really charged emotions or difficult topics. One of the best ways we can create the conditions for a meaningful conversation that's productive is to do our own work internally to heal and prepare for the conversation. So this might mean, in many instances, getting a lot of empathy ourselves, finding someone who can listen to us however we want to express ourselves and offer understanding so that we feel heard, understood, so that we clarify what's going on for us, so that we deactivate internally. Sometimes with a really difficult situation, there might be strong emotions we need to process. I know for many with what's happening in the Middle East, it's a lot of pain, fear, grief, and mourning. It's difficult to have a conversation through the intensity of those emotions. So the more we can prepare and process some of that grief, some of that intensity, some of that pain, the more we can start from a place of being clear and grounded and resourced. Really important question to ask ourselves before a conversation is, are we actually ready to listen to each other? Given the deep trauma that's being experienced by so many people around the world in relation to what's happening, um, one of the things that I think is needed is just for spaces for individuals to feel heard and understood before there can be any dialogue across differences. So this is some of the inner work of preparing and healing ourselves that is so essential. And there are many other tools we can draw on for this, but just making time and space for it, I think, is important. Next is a certain kind of orienting to the conversation by reflecting on our purpose and our values. There are many different kinds of conversations we can have. If we're not clear about our purpose, chances are the conversation might not go in the direction we want. So taking some time to identify what are your goals. And there can be more than one goal for a conversation, but the clearer we are about our purpose going into a conversation, the more we can try to create the conditions for that to happen. So for example, um, is this a conversation that whose aim is healing? Are we just trying to hear one another? Is it a conversation where we're trying to do that in both directions or just in one direction? Is one of your purposes in the conversation to try to influence someone else's views, their choices or behavior? That's a different kind of conversation. If so, what will support that? And I'll talk some more about that as, as we go further. It's important to ask oneself, how relevant is it to build relationship and trust in the conversation? How much does that exist already? If it doesn't or if it's strained, how much attention is uh, needed to give to that in order to create the conditions for the kind of conversation we want to have? How much of this conversation is not about the relationship or hearing one another, but is about honoring your own integrity, say, drawing a line or speaking out, not being complicit 
by being silent about something, uh, cutting through the tension of what's known as negative peace, this kind of avoidance of conflict or disagreement to keep the harmony, but there's actually a certain tension and loss of vitality in that. So as we begin to identify more clearly our purpose and our goals in the conversation, the next piece that emerges is what are the values I'm bringing to this conversation that I want to stay connected to and that I want to animate how I show up and engage? What are the intentions that will be most helpful to guide me in this conversation? For example, do I want to keep coming back to a stance of listening and trying to understand? Is patience something that's going to be helpful or important for me in this conversation? Or is it more courage feeling my strength, finding my voice. So whatever you identify as, say, your intention or a certain value that you want to stay connected to, again, it can be helpful to prepare by strengthening your experience and your connection to that intention or value. So one way of doing this is by meditating on the intention or the value and bringing to mind a memory an image, a phrase, something that represents and embodies that intention or value for you. And then really feeling it, sensing it, taking it in. So that in the conversation, you can just remember that word, that phrase, that image, and come back to the intention. So for example, let's say, um, let's say your intention is to listen. You really want to create space and offer a kind of... Um, sort of wise and gracious listening to the other person. Maybe you think about Thich Nhat Hanh or the Dalai Lama or Mother Teresa and their capacity for compassion and listening. Or maybe it's an image of nature. Maybe it's the image of uh, a great old tree that stood for centuries that connects you with the steadiness and the patience of really listening. So you find what works for you. But strengthen that connection and feel that experience so that it's there for you when you need it in the moment. Okay, so we've talked about um, these two parts of preparing for the conversation, some of the inner healing work and then clarifying your purpose, your values, and any intention that's going to support you in the conversation. I just want to pause and just see, is, is this all making sense? Is this resonating for folks? Yeah, okay. All right. You know, I, I think I'm just going to make a sort of overarching comment here. I think central to this whole theme we're exploring and that I'm offering with you tonight is just the recognition that communication and conversations uh, is a skill that we can develop. And the more time and energy and attention and effort we put in to preparing, the better off we're going to be. And like anything else, um, there are certain conditions that need to be present for the outcome we want to have. Um, so attending to those conditions is what, uh, what I'm suggesting here. All right, so the next, the next area uh, of focus is something that can feel a little bit awkward or you know, surprising perhaps, but it's rehearsing. So actually practice having the conversation. It's best to do this with another person if you can, not the person you're gonna have the conversation with, but someone else. Um, in a kind of like role play, almost theatrically. But, you know, if you don't have somebody else to have the conversation with, uh, make a sock puppet <laughs> or look in the mirror. And you can imagine what the other person might say. You can hear it in your mind and and practice. what What is it that you want to get across? You know, are there key phrases of things that you want to say? Know your tendencies. Where are you likely to get tripped up in the conversation? What's going to activate you? And how will you handle that? How will you respond when difficult comments are made by the other person? Are you able to find your ground to uh, regroup, to take a deep breath and let the sort of wave of 
reactivity or defensiveness come, come wash through you instead of acting on it. The more we practice with that, the more likely we are to be able to do it in the conversation. So if this is an important conversation to you, if it's one that you want to go well or you want to increase the chances of it going well, practice. Take time to do that ahead of time. Okay. Um, I see that there are numbers on the chat. Somebody opened it up. That's fine. But just so you know, I'm not looking at the chat. So if you're asking me questions, if you're telling me you love it, if you're criticizing me and saying I hate it, that's okay. But I'm not reading it right now because I'm speaking to you, just so you know. All right, let's talk about some of the key tools that I want to share with you. This is really the, the heart of the matter. And uh, I'm going to read through the list first just to give you an overview. Then I'll take the slide down and talk about each one. Um, so creating supportive structures for the conversation can be very helpful. Letting go of the outcome in the actual conversation. Cultivating curiosity and expressing it by asking questions and reflecting back what you're hearing. Taking things slowly you can do this by chunking information in manageable bits, focusing on one thing at a time. Seeking common ground or agreement wherever you can, and sharing personal stories. I think that's the last bullet here, yeah. So I want to talk about each of these, and uh, maybe I can just also drop this list in the chat for those who are enjoying the chat or wanting to use it. There you go. So create supportive structures. What does this mean? Usually in our day-to-day -day life, we have conversations in a kind of free-form, organic way. It's like jazz. There's, we're just sort of exploring spontaneously. Um, for difficult conversations, for intense conversations, it can be helpful to have some scaffolding, to make some agreements ahead of time about how we're going to have the conversation. So this could be something as simple as agreeing to take turns speaking and setting a timer. Like, I'll talk for five minutes and then you talk for five minutes. Uh, it could be breaking the conversation down into parts. If you know there's a, a lot of ground you want to cover, so you say, well, let's talk tonight for 45 minutes and um, I'll just listen to you and try to understand your views and feelings and experience. And I'll ask questions and I'll listen. I'm not going to share my responses. And then tomorrow you'll listen to me for 45 minutes and do the same. Right. It doesn't mean we're not going to mess up and get defensive or try to say something. But if we've made that agreement ahead of time, when we move outside of that boundary, we now have two subjectivities, two awarenesses to bring us back on track and say, hey, wait, we agreed we we're going to do it this way. Let's let's come back to focus here. You might make agreements about what topics you're going to cover and what topics you're not going to cover. Uh, I watched a documentary a few weeks ago um, about the Oslo Accords, uh, peace process in the Middle East in the 90s and the early 2000s that never came to fruition for a variety of reasons. Um, but there's very powerful, many very powerful moments in the movie. And one that really stood out to me was early in the dialogues that led to the Oslo Accords when the first uh, parties from each side of the PLO uh, and Israel were meeting, two of the key players uh, who had both grown up um, in Israel and Palestine had a very painful conversation about the different narratives of the past. And they agreed that night because it was so painful and inflaming that they would avoid talking about the past. They said, Let's never talk about the past again and only focus on the future, because that was their purpose, was to reach an agreement for how to live in peace together. And they said, that topic is not going to get us there. So this is an example of an agreement that we can make in a conversation to stay focused on our purpose and work together towards it. The next tool is often counterintuitive. And this is to let go of the outcome. Particularly if your goal is um, to have influence or to change somebody's views in a certain way, 
change happens slowly and it often requires time more than one conversation. The more you uh, try to focus narrowly on getting to a certain point or an outcome, that creates tension in the relational space. Um, and it leads to certain ways of relating and certain intentions that erode trust and that block understanding. On the, on the other hand, if you focus more on how you're engaging and building understanding rather than changing someone's mind, you create the conditions for beginning to hear one another and have more leverage. Is there anything else I want to say on this? Letting go of the outcome doesn't mean we give up on what's important to us. It means that we temporarily are putting that down in order to be present with the human being in front of us and with what is unfolding and true in the moment, which is unpredictable, which is messy, which is confusing. If we're constantly introducing our agenda to that, we miss all kinds of possibilities to connect, to have insight into one another, to see the human being, to find common ground that we didn't know was there. So letting go of the outcome doesn't mean we give up on what's important to us. It just means we're creating a certain space to explore while still holding fast to whatever your values are or your goal is, but not pushing it. There, of course, there are different phases of a conversation and a relationship, and there's a time to bring one's purpose or request forward. But I'm talking about um, more this exploration phase of a relationship and conversation. So the next tools are around curiosity. One of the best ways to build trust is to ask personal open-ended questions about others. Questions create safety, they show respect, they contribute to understanding, they can elicit empathy and valuable information. So can you come from a genuine intention to understand? Genuine, not performative, not manipulative, to truly understand the human being in front of you. And then ask questions and then listen to what they say. Listen and try to understand it. One way of doing that is to offer some kind of verbal reflection of what you're hearing. The premise here is that underneath everything we do and say as human beings are certain underlying shared universal view, uh, needs or values that part of what makes us human is that we all want to be understood, to be seen, to live in peace, to uh, raise our children, to have safety and education. These are things that we can recognize in one another because of our shared humanity. So to listen for those things and to actively um, offer back to the person what we're understanding, either by summarizing it, um, by getting to the heart or the essence of what's been said, and ask follow-up questions, which then furthers the relationship. And it's really important to note here that um, empathizing with someone, trying to understand them, doesn't mean that we agree doesn't mean we agree with their views. It doesn't mean we agree with their interpretation of events. It doesn't mean that we support or condone their actions. It means that we can understand and honor the human experience they are having, the feelings and the needs that are driving them. This capacity to get curious, to show respect, to listen and truly try to understand is deeply transformative. One of the stories I tell in my first book, Say What You Mean, um, is a story of an African-American blues musician named Daryl Davis, who um, grew up abroad, moved to the United States when he was about 10, was playing in a jazz band, marching in the street, and uh, people started throwing bottles and food at him because he was the only Black kid in the band. And he didn't understand what was happening. Somebody had to explain to him later about racism because he hadn't experienced it outside of the United States before. And his response, having not grown up and been infected with the disease of racism, was, how can they hate me if they don't know me? 
And he was able to stay connected to the beauty and potency of that question into his adult life, such that when he met a member of the KKK at a gig in Maryland many years later, he struck up a conversation with him and through many conversations actually became friends with him and got really, really interested in the Klan in that particular area and started interviewing members of the Klan for a book. And he got into some dicey situations, um, but managed to stay safe. But through the power of his relationships, through the genuineness of his curiosity and his intention to understand and his kindness, he built real relationships such that more than 200 members of the Klan gave up their membership. The whole organization collapsed in that region through the relationships that he built. So this is just one example of the power of this intention to understand and our genuine curiosity. Of course, there are other considerations and factors in that story. It's not the work of African Americans to heal white supremacy and white violence. That's our work <laughs> as white identified people. So it's just uh, that's more of a sort of contextual uh, point of the story. Um, but nonetheless, the power of that human connection stands. So we've talked about um, creating supportive structures, letting go of the outcome, getting curious. Next, take it slowly. It's easy to get activated in difficult conversations. Things move quickly. We begin talking over one another. The more we can slow things down, first by just regulating our own nervous system, the more chance we have of actually having the conversation we want. So this means using the skills of mindfulness, feeling your body, breathing. If you can, try to speak at a pace that is well-regulated in order to do that, you have to slow your breathing. And when you slow your breathing, you regulate your nervous system. When you're speaking, use a skill that's called chunking. Just share one thing. Don't share the whole paragraph. Just share one sentence. And take things one step at a time. The more you do that, the more you can check that you're both on the same page and hearing one another. Another thing that happens in difficult conversations is before you finish one topic, another topic gets introduced. And before you finish that one, there's a third and a fourth. And all of a sudden, it's a big mess. There's a whole maze. So try to stay focused on one thing at a time. If another topic comes up, acknowledge it. It's important. Let's stay with this one until we're finished with it. So try to stay focused and redirect as needed. Within this process of listening, of taking it slow, look for areas of agreement, however small, any kind of common ground. Look for things you can agree with, the values or needs behind someone's statement, the hopes they have, the outcome they're wanting. And anytime there's any sense of common ground or mutual mutuality, highlight it, name it, celebrate it that those are strengths, that's gold to not overlook. So even if it's, you know, wow, this is really hard. Yeah, it is, you know, connecting on that level, acknowledging it, right? Or, you know, I, I'm just feeling like kind of hopeless and frustrated in this moment. I'm the guy, that look on your face, it sounds like you're feeling the same way. Yes, you know, here we are both trying and we're not hearing each other. There's common ground there. We're, we're sharing that experience. So framing things in terms of the we, both of us and the things that we are experiencing or the things that we can see eye to eye on or agree on is really essential. Finally, share personal stories rather than going into facts or um, making moralistic statements. There's more room for connection when we speak personally, share your stories. In particular, if you're wanting to influence somebody, how your own views have changed over time. This is often a way of introducing new ideas in a non-threatening manner. Ask people to see things from a personal level, to imagine their family member their child, their mother, their grandparent in that situation and how it would be for them. 
this is this is where change happens when it's personal when we can feel it when we have a connection and finally if you've had a discussion if you have both shared and you've taken time thank people thank them for their time thank them for their energy thank them for their willingness to engage that keeps the door open for future dialogues I also want to acknowledge that there are times where we might need to set limits. We might need to um, gracefully exit a conversation, um, to say no. When we've reached our capacity, we can't listen anymore. It's probably better to stop the conversation than to pretend or try to keep going and do more damage. So when we need to set a limit like that, um, we want to do it in a way that creates a, a, as least harm and disconnection as possible in order to maintain the relationship or some um, mutual respect. And so, you know, acknowledging whatever has been said, trying to affirm some uh, sense of the other person or where they're coming from and then sharing what whatever it is for you that's your limit you know? i'm glad we're having this conversation and that you feel comfortable sharing your views with me um, and i don't think i can go on hearing what you just said because it's too upsetting for me and then don't stop there, offer something. Can we come back to this tomorrow? Or I might be willing to continue if we can pause here and you can just hear how that affects me and why I'm so upset. So if you're going to say no, if you're going to set a limit, um, don't just stop there. Try to suggest something for what could happen next, even if it's, I'm going to take a break and I'll get in touch in a couple of days and let you know what I want to do from here. But, but don't just leave it hanging by offering something again that continues the whatever goodwill you've built in the conversation i think i want to end with um a quote from uh, shimon perez uh, who took over from um Oh, am I blanking on the prime minister's name who was involved in the Oslo Accords before uh, Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin, before, after he was assassinated. Um, this is from the last interview uh, done with Shimon Peres. The interviewer asked him, do you still believe there's a chance for peace between Jews, Israelis, and the Palestinians? I don't think there's another alternative neither for the Palestinians nor for us. The only alternative is an ongoing war. But contrary to what people think in war, there are no victories, only victims. No war is ever finished unless it's being replaced by peace. So I thank you for your kind attention and listening. I hope that some of what I have shared has been useful for you. Uh, and we have some time now um, for questions uh, and comments. So let's open it up. Um, you can use the chat to, um, to share questions. And um, I'll do my best to offer something that's useful. Sure, I'll put the quote in the chat, try to get back to it. Uh, yeah, Madison. Hi, Oren. It's it's great to see you and hear you. Um, I wouldn't touch the Middle East um, subject right now for myself, but I do have an issue with a client. And what you reminded me is that I can, and, and maybe you can speak more about that, I'm very quick trigger response 
I have very quick responses and sometimes I have responses that take 24 hours and that's where I can get into trouble. And yeah. I have a client relationship where I was feeling insulted by something she said. And I realized while you were speaking that, um, oh my God, there's a different way to handle this. And I'm going to see her tomorrow while I'm in the middle of seeing another client. So I won't have time to have a long talk, but I'm wondering or thinking that maybe I incorporate some of this and just saying, I want to take this action of this thing that you need. Here's this thing that you need. And if there's more of a discussion, I'm happy to have it mm -hmm. at another time. Yeah. Because I also feel very strongly that I'm willing for the outcome to be from her. Oh, I don't like you. I think you neglected doing my job. I don't want to have you do any further work for me. I'm, I'm yeah. willing to let go yeah. of that. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a skillful strategy, Madison, to try to contain things and make one statement and separate the conversation. Yeah, yeah. But just very meaningful to hear this stuff again, and I'm remembering my history with yeah. you and and how shocking it has been for me to realize, oh my God, there's another point of view. <laughs> just that yeah, in, in the talks we've had in the past. So um, deeply appreciate what you're saying and thank um, you. thanks, Madison. hope to practice it tomorrow. So thank good, you. Good luck. You're welcome. And um, maybe before taking the next question, I meant to mention at the end of my talk, so I'll just do it now. Um, um, just a shameless plug. I have a new book coming out in two weeks. Um, the meditation that I shared is uh, from the book, part of the meditation. And so I just wanted to put drop a link in the chat here. It's like the link is wrong. I have to do that again. Um, but it's called Your Heart Was Made for This Contemplative Practices for Meeting a World in Crisis with Courage, Integrity, and Love. And uh, there's a whole bunch of practices and resources for uh, building inner strength to engage with the challenges of our time. Uh, so just sharing that. All right, um, Elaine, and then Ali, or Ali. Um, thank you. Um, gosh, thank you so much. Uh, you kind of answered a question um, I had with the last thing that you mentioned about not, um, about boundaries and mm. not, uh, because I I was in this situation, and it's interesting because one one of your steps is a structured conversation, and that would really be nice if if one could enter in when these things happen and it was a structured conversation. But but you know these things sort of fall in your face, <laughs> you know, with no no intent about having a conversation sometimes, and. Um, so I was in in a small group in a in a breakout room, and um, this was a political Middle East situation, and uh, the person really erupted in a rage, mm -hmm. and um, was met with silence. Mm -hmm. um, and because what what can I mean? My 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 feeling was what can you say? Mm -hmm. uh, that that was that person's reaction and yet it was scary um uh it w was kind of i mean it was i felt it was clearly a place like we ness we wouldn't be hurt if if any of us said anything they you know they sort of needed the space to express themselves but looking back what was also needed um, was somebody to simply say, I hear you, because yeah. there was this long space of silence yeah. and that person felt really hurt and insulted and that we yeah. totally disagreed and judged yeah. and whatever possible yeah. negative thing yeah. coming after after they kind of ripped open their own heart from what they were feeling. Yeah. And... Um, and and so that was not a planned conversation. Um, I think yes. 
Forgive me for interrupting you. Just in the interest of time and trying to hear from as many people as possible, I want to know, Are you? is there a question you're getting to or are you more just sharing this experience and the well, learning you got from it? Well, could you say anything more about um, acknowledging that person or what would have been a better yeah. thing to do? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thank you for stopping me. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I mean, I think what you just said was beautiful. I hear you. Um, two beautiful words that we can say when people share something, and it's amazing how um, many situations these words um, can be useful in are thank you. Thank you for what you just shared. Thank you for opening up your heart. Thank you for expressing what's going on for you. You know, and then there's their deeper layers, as I was referring to in the talk, of uh, reflective listening, this kind of genuine way of trying to connect with the essence of what someone's shared, you know, saying back to them what we're getting, not in a technique way, but in, in a real human way. Like, um, I feel a little awkward doing this because what you shared was just so intense, but I, I want to just acknowledge, like, it sounds like this has been earth shattering for you mm -hmm. and that you are filled with rage and anger and intensity and hurt, uh, you know, and I just want to make space to honor mm -hmm. that. Tell me if I'm, if I'm missing anything, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if, if I could say, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's important for, for, for us to have a practice, to be able to have that yes. presence of mind to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I teach my communication classes is because we need to practice it. Yeah. Absolutely. All Thank right. you so much. You're welcome. Okay. We've got um, 10 minutes here. So let's try to see if we can hear from Ali, Dee, and Rachel. Hi there. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Oren, for sharing this timely topic. I'm wondering on the, uh, as far as, you know, the engaged Buddhism, how can that fuel, you know, most of the practice, the, the sanghas or places that are, they don't have any sanghas or solitary. How can that engaged Buddhism fuel uh, the personal practice of each of us? And uh, if you know any resources in the light of, you know, what's happening now that, you know, if you can reach out to. And thank you so much for this yeah. great topic. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand what you mean in terms of how the engaged Buddhism can fuel my practice, support the practice, even the solitary practice that I do. Ah, uh, I see. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, our practice is about uh, alleviating suffering, and that's what engaged Buddhism is about. It's about responding to the suffering in the world. So whether it's the situation in the Middle East, whether it's um, the refugee crisis in Afghanistan or, you know, hunger in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there's many ways we can get involved in our world and contribute. So um, I think that finding a way to express your love, your care, your compassion is essential. And then that's going to feed back into your practice because it will nourish your heart. It will feed um, integrity, energy, um, it will uh, highlight the beauty of generosity and compassion. It will um, reduce the sense of egocentrism and attachment to one's views by contributing to others. So it's just essential to get involved, to find out what's yours to do in any area and to, um, to respond. Um, as far as the situation in the Middle East, um, it's quite dire. Um, I know there are um, many organizations working to um, try to get humanitarian aid or to find another way forward other than more war and violence. Uh, George Lakey just published an article on the website Waging Nonviolence um, with some ideas uh, the group Jewish Voice for Peace is doing a tremendous amount of organizing in the United States um, to try to stop the violence. Um, so those are a few a few ideas. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Thank you. Uh, all right, the person known as D. Hi, um, my name is Debbie Oren. Thank you so much for doing this on so many levels. I have a quick strategy question for you. Please, yeah. 
because you said something, um, especially in the context of practicing NVC and keeping relations going, um, of keeping the connection open, how would one balance that with the con conservation of energy? Like some con conversations we want to continue. Yeah, and some we don't, right? In some, in, so yeah. how do you, how do you um, arrange, for example, of responses? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe two things. One, maybe just to contextualize what I was saying there, there is a kind of unspoken assumption that this is that this is a relationship we want to continue, you know, and that we are choosing to invest the energy. And I want to be really clear that, of course, there are relationships in our life that we choose not to want to continue. And um, I am not at all opposed to that. We, you know, need to conserve our energy. So, um, however, I think that it's tragic how quick we can be to cut someone out of our life. And um, not suggesting that's what you're saying, but you know, um, in terms of setting setting those boundaries or conserving our energy, um, I think finding ways to be honest that that are still loving. You know, I remember saying to one person who I'm actually good friends with now, but. 20 years ago when we first met, uh, saying to him, you know, I, I'm so touched that you want to be friends and I would love to, and I, I just don't have the time. I don't have space in my life for another friend right now. You know, so being able to be real, but still uh, kind and connected to the love in our heart. And when we do need to actually... Um, step back from a relationship, uh, you know, to share why and and to try to leave an open door to say, you know, I, I can't do this anymore right now because of this and that. Um, and maybe in another year when things are different, I'll feel different. And, you know, I invite you to get in touch or I'll reach out to you if I'm ready. You know, some sense of, of there being an open door that's that's my take on it. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Okay. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. I enjoyed your talk. It's very pertinent to me personally at this moment in my life. So I had this experience where this um, pg and &E guy came over to my house and he actually threatened me to call the sheriff on me, which was pretty shocking because I'm not the kind of person that that happens to in my whole life. And so the conversation just kind of got shut off right there. But, you know, I if there's a threatening situation like that, even though that nothing bad was actually going to happen, you know, I just terminated that. But I'm wondering if there's other other ways, you know, because if something ever gets a little too threatening, you know, I'm just out of there and I don't stay with it, even though nothing's really going to happen. So do you have any comments about that? If somebody is kind of over reactive kind of calming them down or coming to a more mutual place or what do you think about that practice radical transparency here rachel and, and share with you that my attention drifted from you to the chat for a moment <laughs> um the question about the george lakey article uh which I posted the link to in the chat. So I'll tell you what I caught from what you said, and then maybe fill in the details that I missed if, if they're relevant. Um, you had an interaction with someone from PG&E and they got really upset and activated and you didn't quite know how to respond. And maybe you ended up just shutting right, they things down. Yeah, they threatened to call the sheriff on me uh, oh, wow. because they were supposed to take an action uh, uh -huh. before they yeah, yeah. the sheriff. And they didn't do the action. And I told them, I said, I'm sorry, you can't, you know, this has to be inspected before any yeah. work. Can... And so then I got threatened with the sheriff, which was for me, made me cry for like two and a half hours because I don't have a lot of skills in dealing with something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, well, well so... you know, what one of the skills we develop in not only our meditation practice, but our communication practice is to be um, honest about what's true in the moment. 
So in that moment of being threatened, if you know you haven't been practicing communication for 20 years and you don't know exactly the right thing to say, which is most people alive, you know, maybe you just say, wow, I feel really shocked and scared right now and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And that buys you a little bit of time and it humanizes you. Right. Right. And it's like, I'm confused and stuck. Um, I hear you saying this and um, I want to find another way forward. Do you have any ideas? You know, so you can kind of walk yourself through it by just being true to what's actually present for you in uh, in the moment. And then, of course, there are, you know, tools of de-escalation that are really useful to develop. This skill of active listening that I've been referring to, or reflective listening, empathy, being able to um, affirm what somebody is saying in a way that helps them feel heard and deactivate without agreeing with them. You know, um, I'm hearing you telling me that you are doing your job and this is the only way forward and that um, you need X, Y, and Z from me. Am I getting it? You know, just saying back, well, here's what I'm hearing, right? So the person feels heard. They know that you get it, right? Maybe being able to um, be transparent about where you're, where you're coming from. Like, I'm so sorry if I offended you. I'm not trying to step uh, on your turf or tell you how to do your job. Um, I'd like, can I just try to explain again what I was saying in a different way? Because I think we got off on, on the wrong foot here. Right, so you're trying to take a step back and do it over is another another skill you can use. Is any of that helpful? Yeah, no, I think that is helpful because I think in the moment, first of all, I'm I don't usually get in that place ever. Yeah. But you know, but people are much more motivated nowadays, and you know, you know, people are just grumpy all over the place, and so. I think having for myself a better set of skills yeah. is going to be helpful because yeah. I just know people are grumpy. <laughs> so, so good. yeah. All right. Okay. That's very All right. good. Well, thanks, thanks. for having me. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Take care. You too.